Welcome. Thank you for coming out. Um, Cozy Sheridan is a brilliant songwriter. And beyond that, she's one of the most insightful and intelligent people I've ever met. Although she will absolutely demonstrate to you that she can be irreverent. <laughs> I will also tell you that you will see and hear that she takes the craft of writing a song very, very seriously. She's worked at it for close to three decades now. And it shows. Aside from the accolades of consistently rave reviews and winning several national awards for her songwriting, Cozy writes songs that actually matter. They have something to say, often tackling issues that challenge us both individually and collectively. Her music is timely. At the same time, she draws on archetypal imagery and truths so that her songs touch a deep and diverse range of emotions in ways that draw both understanding and empathy from the audience. She can make you laugh. She can make you cry. Sometimes she'll even do it in the same song. Her guitar mastery is stellar. Her vocals showcase melodies that marry flawlessly with her lyrics. Cozy is also a gifted teacher, and I hope this format tonight will give us an opportunity to get a glimpse of that. And finally, although I know Cozy will introduce him properly somewhere along the way, let me also acknowledge Charlie Cook, who is not only Cozy's musical partner, he is her life partner. And Charlie is a very good songwriter in his own right, and maybe you'll get to hear that too. Now please welcome Cozy Sheridan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Cozy, why don't you start us off with a song? All right, this is um, this song that uh, Charlie and I, uh, Charlie's, Charlie's just, the chorus is Charlie's brilliant innovation of rapping a melody, so I'll just tell you that. I did the verses, but. <laughs> Okay, let's get the vitals out of the way. 
What's the name on the birth certificate? Uh, Cornelia McCoy Sheridan. And the place? Concord, New Hampshire. So when we first met, you lived in New England. Mm -hmm. And then for many years, you were in Moab, Utah. Mm -hmm. Now back in New England, specifically Boston now, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Does you feel like you're home now? Uh, yes, although when I go back to Moab, Utah, that feels like home too. That's so that's great. a really nice thing. It's nice. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about your early music uh, development, your education. Did you, did you have formal or classical training? I did. I, uh, in my family, you had to play two years of piano. And uh, my sister was a concert pianist, and I was never going to equal her. So as soon as I was done with my two years, I was out of there because the, the, the uh, piano teacher kept saying, don't you want to be as good as your sister? So I thought, you know what? I'm going to find a different instrument. <laughs> so um, I also, you know, when they started the band program, I took up oboe. Why? I can't remember. Um, and, and I learned uh, pretty much all of my music theory by playing oboe. I played it all the way until the end of uh, high school. And, uh, but there was a guitar under the piano. And the guitar was never touched, but my babysitter across the street played guitar, and she said she would teach me. So at nine, I carried my guitar across the street once a week, and she would teach me how to play guitar. So yes, I definitely have uh, a lot of stuff that me meant that I can read music. It's not like that's how I approach the guitar, though, because it's interesting that all the classical stuff was, well, the oboe lessons and the piano lessons. But then when you played guitar, it was fun, because it just said little boxes, and there was an A chord over one, and then a D chord, and it was so much less worry than having to read the music. So. Every time it came to guitar, it was like relaxing, so. When you brought it, when you, when you did that, did you bring any of that theory to, to that, to the I guitar? I do now. I didn't for a long time. Uh, it, probably until my late 20s when I, I mean, I always had it. I could read and I knew what was going on. But I really started integrating it when I sort of came to a part of point in my songwriting when I'd written every song that was just naturally going to occur to me. And I had to start thinking, okay, how are you going to build a song differently now. Oh, now we should start thinking about the theory of it. We're going to talk more about that. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I want to come back to your um, to your upbringing and your family. Uh, you've written a, a number of songs that reference your dad mm -hmm. and your mom, mm -hmm. and there's some of my favorites, in fact, of your songs. Um, would you talk to us a little bit about one or both of them, and their impact on you, and how that has found its way into your music? Yeah, um, I think. Even though my dad was musical and emotionally he was like the softy in the family, so he's the, you know I sat on his lap. My mom's family was the more musical, and her father was my greatest musical influence. My grandfather, who used to come to the house and he would play stride piano, um, he would entertain us for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And he d he taught himself how to play piano, and he played that beautiful stride. And we had this old grand piano, and I could sit under it as a child. And if you've ever looked under a, under a piano where the soundboard is there's huge squares of, of the, the, the bracing. Well, if you're five years old, your foot fits perfectly inside that bracing, and you feel the piano, and you feel everything it does. It's like having, you know, your feet are getting the entire sound. And I fell in love with acoustic music because of that huge amount of energy coming at me from the piano. And you wrote a song about that. I did, I wrote a song about my grandfather doing that very thing. Yeah. Yeah. You wanna do that? What sure, do you yeah, I, I, uh, I, 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 we have to do an open tuning. Uh, so George would play the music, and he had taught himself to play piano. And this this song actually was a, has a has a long um, has an 18 year arc of creation. When I was in high school, I went to a boarding school, and they it was in the 80s when everybody's a little bit hippy dippy, and uh, they let me have a senior project of learning how to be a folk singer. And I got to go to bars, and I had a guitar teacher, and he said we're, we're going to write songs. So this is a song that I wrote for my senior recital in high school part of it. And then I put it away for 18 years because it really wasn't quite what this song is now, but the, 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 the generous, you know, the, the seed of it definitely was that. And over the years as I performed it, I wanted to get people to have a feeling of what George felt like when he showed up. So here's how it starts. I'd like you to imagine that on stage is a grand piano. Seated at it is a man in a gray suit with a red tie. He's playing 76 trombones, lead the big parade. And his grandchildren are marching around the room. It's Thanksgiving. 
When my grandmother leaves the room, he will sing you dirty verses to songs he learned in college. Get out your old rubber bustle. Get out and hustle, cause the rent is coming due. While you're out there making money, I'll be waiting for you, honey. If you can't get five, take two. Well, my grandfather used to play 76 trombones. And Miss Otis regrets on a piano, on a down on a flat red truck, all the way down Main Street with the color guard and the vets. And my grandmother saved the picture that they ran in the paper, George and his ivories in the lead. 76 trombones lead the big parade, George and his 88 keys. And Miss Otis regrets that George will be unable to lunch today. Cause he's down the hall in his room with some childhood tune that will not get out of his way. And there's a bird on the windowsill, or is that his old backyard? And the sparrow that once sat on his palm. 76 trombones lead the big parade in George's head. Now they all play different songs. And she wore a tulip, a big yellow tulip, and he wore a big red rose. And George wears what the nurse dresses him in. Now he can't understand his clothes. And my grandmother comes to help him eat his lunch every day and sits with him through the long afternoon. 76 trombones lead the big parade and love does not forget its tune. sweet sound let it come and abide with me in the gathering dark we'll play a song in f sharp george taught himself on just the black keys and we'll play it by ear to call heaven near where not one note has to sound alone and 76 trombones the big parade and George all the way home Thank you I think my guitar thing fell out so you lost my guitar part way up we're in now we're good Okay. Tonight I want to uh, continue with the change that we introduced last time, and I want to, rather than waiting to the end of the show to give the audience uh, an opportunity to participate, I want to start early. Okay. And uh, I want to give the audience, and particularly the students who are here, but anybody, I know there are a number of people in the audience uh, who have uh, aspirations to be songwriters. And so I want to give folks an opportunity um, to ask some questions. But before I do that, knowing that, I guess what I would ask you in a, in a general sense, Cozy, is for, some, for, for people who are really, who have the aspiration or just really trying to figure out how to get started, what's the advice that you would give them? To get started writing or to get started writing and then going out and playing it? Those are two That's a good things. question. You can, yeah. To get started writing, um, in some of my classes for people who aren't musically trained classically, you know, and they just, I say, find a song you love, 
and take the words off it and write your words to it and then take the melody away and write a new melody to your words. And that's, you know, that's like you know, tinker toy songwriting to get started. Um, but that's, that's sort of the, 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 uh, the nuts and bolts of it. Yeah, a lot of it is just figuring out what it is you want to say. If you know what you want to say, the song comes really quickly. I think it's figuring out what it is we want to say. We have such busy lives now, it's hard to hear that little quiet voice that says, I want to write a song about something from you know your past, something like that. Yeah. How about you all? What kind of what kind of questions would you would you have? What would you like to ask, Marty? I think this is going to be touched on a little bit more girl information, but just hearing that last song, I'm a music professor here, it's just riddled with references of theory and uh, the piano without saying it. So to me, you mentioned about how you took piano and you were on oboe, but did you have any kind of formal training after uh, high school oboe playing days, or because it seemed like there's more. I went to Berkeley College of Music for um, two semesters. Like many people, I dropped out of Berkeley. Um, and I went, I wanted to be a guitar student, and they wouldn't let me in because I didn't, it, it, they had a, at that time they had a test that said, can you play in second position? And I was a folk singer. I'm like, I don't know what that means. I said this. So anyway, so I didn't get the guitar. And they made me a vo voice vocal student. So I learned some stuff there. So a little bit, I started to get some stuff about harmonization. And then I've taught at a lot of uh, camps, actually, where there's been just these amazing teachers. Who, and I've sort of tried to pick up what they know. And I've read a lot. I've decided, you know what, I need no more theory. So let's see, I ordered theory for dummies from the internet. And then I went to the Berkeley website and I looked at all their songwriting teachers' books. And I ordered the one that said uh, Perricone's Theory of Melody. And I, I learned a lot from that book. So I've kind of kept teaching myself. But I have enough basics from childhood you know, of understanding how to read music and how these things work that I think I could build on it. Another question? Yes, ma'am. As you said earlier, you did the piano training and stuff, but how easy was it for you to learn uh, guitar? I started early, so it, it was, uh, you know, when you're nine, it, you know, they said put your fingers here, and then put your fingers here and here, and then you play it all the time. Um, and so for me, it was it was pretty easy, and I've just always played it. It's very, it's almost, I've grown up with it. I've played it now for 45 years, so, you know, it's, like part of me. In fact, I have a problem now because my neck and my shoulder are so connected muscularly that you know, my massage therapist is always trying to disconnect them. Uh, but I know people who pick it up later, later, and guitar is one of the, I think, easiest instruments. I mean, ukulele is easier, but if you want to learn guitar, you can, I mean, at my camp, we teach people how to play guitar in a week, you know, and they can play a song by the end of a week. It's, it's a very f rewarding instrument to start playing. Also because it's, it's a... You know, it's this thing against your body. It's, it's, I mean, I would play it all day just so I could hear this thing doing this thing against my body. You know, I think most of us, whatever age we are now, would say that we can identify the music and the artist who we listened to in high school and, um, and college as the catalyst for discovering and sort of kindling right. our life's passions. Whose music moved you in that way? When I was a little girl, I wanted to be Bonnie Raitt. And actually, my husband has met her, because when I mean, he was at college, she was there, they're about the same age, so I'm like, you met my, she touched me once at a party. I was so excited, I went to some party, and she had to move me aside so she could go through the crowd, I was touched. Uh, I'm a huge Bonnie Raitt fan. Uh, she was, you know, my brother had Streetlights, that, that record, and I was in second grade, and he had the first Walkman. I'd ever seen. So he walks up to me with what looks to me like this little box. I don't know what it is. And he's got these little tiny little things. And of course, we all know, I know our headphones, but they didn't look like. And he puts it on and he turns on street lights. And I was totally hooked. So it would be de definitely that. One of the things I find interesting is when I talk to people and, uh, you know, about who were your songwriting heroes and who, who influenced you. And then trying to say, you know, can you hear um, the influences of that person? you know, in, in your songs. Uh, do you have, do you, can you identify in, in, your, in any of your songs? Maybe Where early, they come from? Yeah, in terms of the influences. Um, from, I also listen to a lot of Peter, Paul, and Mary because my brothers and sister had their records and Joni Mitchell, so a lot of that stuff. Um, but I can't say, if I think about my earlier stuff, it's much folkier than their stuff. They were much poppier than I was. I didn't have the guitar chops to play what I was hearing. It's only now that it, although I sat in bars, I used to play in bars. 
like her, her vision. So I really eventually learned it. I would speak her guitar style, but I never really, my, my writing never became from that. So we talked about this earlier, but you know, I, I, another question that we always ask pe people is, you know, what, what was the first song, do you remember the first song you, you ever wrote? And a lot of times I think the answer for most of us is, well, I can't remember it, but I don't remember to play it, you know? But so my question, I, I'll give you, I'll give you uh, a little flexibility on that. Yeah. What's, what's the first song that you would say was a keeper? Oh, I could, that's, it's easy, yep. So uh, when I was 20, uh, 20 or 21, I, uh, I told my mother's car while she was on vacation in the Okefenokee Swamp. <laughs> And uh, it, was, it, was, it was totally an accident. I was driving in a blizzard in New Hampshire, and my, the car coming at me slid into my lane, and we did it really slowly. But, you know, still, I told her little Subaru. And, uh, and I was sitting in, I may be conflating two different things, but I was sitting in my kitchen feeling just like I needed my mother. And it's long before cell phones. And uh, so I conjured her up, and I have to say that longing feeling, I have written a lot of songs on that, oh my God, I so badly need to be near this person. That's an incredibly strong feeling, and, and I just wanted to say, I once heard Robert uh, uh, Bly speak about the fact that creativity, a lot of it, is the, we are born with the longing muscle. And the longing muscle is, is, is an important creative event. And, and in our current society, you can get almost anything you want overnight from Amazon. So longing is a hard thing to, but the longing for a person, which you, Amazon will not deliver the next day, for me has often been, I mean, Charlie was once a long, long way away and I, I wrote this song just because I, I just wanted to think, be able to think about being with him. So this was me trying to think at very early before I'd written any songs that I kept about how to be with my mom. My mother's hands put four young heads to sleep night after night. The story's been read and the prayers have been said and she'll sing when they turn out the light that I know where I'm going. Turn around, turn around, turn around. There's a long, long trail the wind. kind of say I didn't write the chorus, I just assembled it. There was a velveteen rabbit and Winnie the Pooh. In summer I go to sleep by light. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. God be with you all through the night. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow with Noah and all in his ark. I fear no evil, but leave on the hall light Cause I am still afraid of the dark And I know where I'm going Turn around, turn around, turn around There's a long, long trail the winding To where I lay me down There when life is a struggle and there are days to surrender the fight I can read my own stories and say my own prayers and even turn out the light but if I found a lantern and one wish were mine I think I know what it would be it would not be fame and it would not be wealth just my mother Sing me to sleep. I know where I'm going. Turn around, turn around, turn around. There's a long, long trail, the winding to where I lay me down. Thank you. Lost this again. Really interesting. You're not muted, are you? I am. 
I'm so sorry, Bill. That's okay. <laughs> you, you have every permission to hit that little okay, button with your foot I, if it's I, orange I, again. I totally forgot. I thought about it. Yeah. Okay. Well, I um, keep if I didn't make around. it clear earlier by inviting you in, that meant any time. So, um, you know, if you have a question or a comment or a whatever, uh, you know, after a song, if, if, something, if, it, if it prompts something you want to know, just uh, let us know. Question? Okay. Um, Cozy, mm -hmm. you are better than anybody I know at using humor uh, in, in your songs. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's always been interesting to me because um, I remember as a, when I first started writing, and I re I've watched this in others, we all, it seems like so many of us, we start out, we want to we wanna write love songs, or we want to write you know, about angst, or we want to write these serious songs, and we eschew the notion of humor because somehow that just seems less serious. <coughs> There you go. There you go. <laughs> and, but what I know, and, and your songs have taught me that as much as anybody, um, is that one, it isn't easy. Uh, and, and, and two, it can be so effective uh, as a means of communication. Talk a little bit about how you do that. Well, I first want to say also, my family valued humor. They valued Tom Lear. Tom Lear was a big hit in our family, and he came to our house. My family, it was in New Hampshire, where if you are in, in the politics, you know, they come to your house. And uh, they had a fundraiser, and Tom Lear came and played our piano. And he played, and I was six years old, and I sat there, and people laughed, and, you know, I could feel the energy in the room. So I was like, I'm going to be able to do this. Uh, but yes, songwriting, that people ask, how do you, how do you teach it? And I, I've never even thought of thinking I could teach, how, teach you how, 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 how humor works. For me, the funny songs are the gift from the gods. The idea or the line that shows up, utterly a gift. I, I was on a hike once, and um, I was trying to find a, I found, I found a rhyme that was um, f for the word menopausal, and I was dying to use a, the rhyme for the word menopausal. <laughs> and I came up with a line, and I built an entire song around the fact that the menopausal line, what rhyme was in it. Um, so, and the songs that have, that have done that, and, and I haven't written one in a number of years, They've often usually come out of a, 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 actually a lot of frustration and pain, something ho horrible. And I've had somehow I've come up with a way to laugh at it. I mean, that's the other gift. Helps you laugh at this thing where you think you, you know you can't laugh at it. So, well, and you do it. I mean, you do it not only in yeah. You write songs that have people rolling in the aisle, but you also use humor even in a serious song, uh, and humor and irony. You know, right. and, and even in a serious song. And I, I, so I think, you, 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 I think that's, that's something you do, is, again, very, very well. I, I, and I was actually warned about it early in my career to stop doing that. <laughs> um, that, you know, if I would stop playing those songs, that, you know, I would do better because people wanted sort of a one, they wanted to know what they were getting from you, you know, that you were like this musician who did that. And I was never that musician because I would be bored myself sitting through that show, so I would go here and here and here. And, and this woman sat me down, she said, you do so much better if you would just... Uh, but I, I, I personally like to laugh. It's, it's just that I like to do it, so I, you know, I'm drawn to it. Well, play us a funny song. Well, and, and that, by the way, With that, right there. No pressure. No, you go anywhere from Waldo to Welcome to Boston. I love it when people also, they introduce me, I say, please, they say, what would you like to do? I say, say anything except that I'm funny. Don't do that. Just, you know, you say that you don't, because it, 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 it's, that's like, when people want to write a song, they say, I, they say, I have this humorous line, and I'm going to write a song. Tell and me I a say, joke. Yeah. And I say, right there, you're dead. Do you think you have a humorous line? You know, right there, the word humorous means you don't actually know if something's funny. Humorous isn't a funny word. Funny is a funny word, you know. How's it? Well, it has to be a good situation that sets it up. Uh, this was uh, my house sitter left her nose ring on the back of the toilet when she moved out one year. And right there, I mean. Uh, uh, and uh, it was at a time that I was thinking of getting something pierced because I was in my late 20s, I think, or maybe my late 30s. I was going to come on one of those birthdays where you're thinking, do I pierce myself this time? And I really was, you know, concerned about this. And this house sitter, she was just beautiful. And so if she put an earring anywhere in her body, it looked fabulous. And if she tattooed something on her body, it looked fabulous. And uh, I uh, was a musician sitting in a car all the time. You know, I didn't have her navel. It wasn't going to happen no matter what I did. So... 
So I decided that, you know, I would write this song and see if anybody else, and that's the other thing about humor. I, had, I wrote a song about yeast infection because I got a $100 speeding ticket on the way to the gynecologist. And, and I, so I write this song. And, I, and for about 20 years, I never had another yeast infection. I, it's almost like they, say, they, they, they heal you. They heal you. So I still have never been pierced, but here's. Some people look sexy and fierce when they are multiply pierced. I must be getting too old All I can think is how would I get that in and out of my nose Some people can look nice With a metallic device Coming out of their face In an unusual place And there are problems too With colorful tattoos They look nice on young skin with healthy collagen but gravity can be sad the wrinkles really won't act these are thoughts of entertain while considering being ritually maimed and it takes poise and a plume and a very taut abdomen why put an earring said that I wrote a song around a, around a rhyme line. I wrote that entire thing about how am I going to rhyme abdomen. When I came up with abdomen and a plomen, I thought, I'm finishing this. So if you come up with the right rhyme, that's it. Okay. okay so I have not thought of the song at all, though, and I don't know how many years, but Will it? Bill brought it up when you might have Totally. And in fact, interestingly enough, Waldo's mom came to see me at a show. <coughs> Waldo was this great dog. Uh, just recently, and you know, Waldo's gone to the happy hunting grounds in the sky a long time ago. So Waldo was written up in about 1996. I was on the road, and uh, I was staying at a house in Palo Alto, California, of a woman. And uh, I stayed there on three critical days in her dog's life. The first day that I arrived, young Waldo was um, a handsome young man, uh, six months old, and he's what your vet would call intact. <laughs> and on the second day that I stayed at Waldo's house, Waldo went to the vet's. And on the third day, he returned with a lampshade on his head, so he would not chew out his stitches. And I had recently written uh, the song about the yeast infection, and somebody had put a review, had written a review of the album that said, here's the latest in Sheridan's female complaint series. <laughs> and I was thinking, well, I need to be an equal opportunity lender, I need a male complaint series, so I'm looking for a male complaint series when I stay at Waldo's house. And I'm sitting there that morning, and Waldo's outside with his lampshade, looking just so depressed and... I mean, it was, he, he was beautifully attired before he lost them. I, I, so these are the true and terrible trials of Waldo the dog. And I'd like to point out that this melody is not mine. It, you don't always have to use your own. Waldo lost his balls today. He does not want to go out and play. He knows some wrong has been done. Waldo, he was real well hung. Now what could have been? Well, now now be. Waldo's wheels are history. He bent a rim, he sprung a spoke. They call him fixed, but he's feeling broke. Now if you run into Waldo's two missing little flowers, he'd like to know why they had to go. He kept them clean for hours. Now he's just a leaf without the bud. Waldo's sleeve has lost its stud. It's a brand new game for the girls and boys. Let's find Waldo's toys. This is when that game was big. I wrote about, you know, where's Waldo? It just come out. If Waldo had two legs, not four, they would have cut less. They would have left more. They'd have left the engine, taken the fuel. Waldo still have the family jewels and his holy heat-seeking device. He's a board game now. 
Without the dice, if only he could have realized the joys of having been the sick. <laughs> and I, that, you know, those songs take a long time, I have to say. That doesn't happen in a week. That happens in months, because you got to sit around and think of every possible, uh, you know, euphemism for losing things, you know. Uh, they, those those kind of songs, they're gifts from the gods, and you know, the thing, but they, they have to be very tightly constructed. And I, the only thing I'll say is, you can't put the funniest thing at the beginning. It's got to it's gotta be so far in that the song's almost done. If you front load a funny song, it's, an, it's a disappointment from the end. The, the, the funniest part can't be, oh my God, I got this funny idea and it's right here at the beginning. It's gotta be towards the end because you gotta build, you know, uh, humor's all about, you know, taking him by surprise and you get him in there and they think, you know, it's amusing and then you come up with this line, so. Great. <laughs> okay, so your songs are often funny. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're intimate or, or introspect introspective, I'll say mm -hmm. that word in a minute. I don't know that I would say you use your songs overtly for activism, but I do know that you've written songs that have a message. Mm -hmm. Yep. Tell us how that functions for you and play us a song that was, dri was driven by a passionate feeling about some issue. Okay. Um, I'm actually gonna do, I'll do one that's m more recent that has remained uh, uh, a little frightening for me because uh, I think of myself as an entertainer. And I uh, started out in the bars in New England where your job is to entertain people, not to be you know, making your statement. And so I have that feeling. And this song, um, I wrote it in January 2017, uh, around the time of the inauguration when the world was getting very violent everywhere. And I was just feeling like my, my town, I didn't know everybody in it, I didn't know my neighbors very well. And Charlie had gone skiing, and I was feeling extremely vulnerable and wishing I had gotten to know my neighbor better. And, uh, and, and I play this song around the country, but it worries me to be divisive as an entertainer. The entertainer part of me wants all of you to feel included in it. The artist in me wants to say something. And for me, this is a constant uh, problem in my life, a confusion for me, uh, that I, I want everyone to feel like they're part of this room, and yet I want to be able to say something that might be divisive, and that's always been an issue. When I did songs about women's issues, I remember they stopped coming to see me. A guy in Dallas picked up a CD one day and he said, oh, I can't stop to see you then because you went through your feminazi period. And I thought, you know, I didn't even know I had the feminazi period and that I'd lost a lot of people because I thought I was just talking about, but I would do songs about women's body Im image issues when I was in my 30s because it was such a big issue for me. I, uh, I had uh, anorexia myself, so I had, did an entire show about it. But I would do it and I would watch some of the audience get uncomfortable and I would lose my courage. And uh, this is actually, I'm gonna get back to that, but I wanted to say, my brother took me to see uh, Eartha Kitt before she died in New York City. It was an amazing gift. And she was in her 80s, but she's wearing a bright pink lame dress, you know, up to here with a slit. And what I learned from Eartha Kitt is, you have to commit 100% to whatever you do when you're, as the performer part we were talking about, you know, the difference in singing. And so, but that's like a life lesson for me. I have to continually learn to commit 100% and not to worry that I might be upsetting somebody, you know. So this song, I wrote it out of a great sense of uh, just needing to feel like I had uh, a sense of community. Good job. Bill's on the job. Good job, Bill. Are we on? Good? Are we good, Bill? Okay. So, uh, I write this in uh, January 2017 because when I've moved into the house that we live in in Boston, the house next to us is empty. There's just two driveways between our houses. I mean, it's, it's really close together. They can see what I'm doing in my living room. I can see what they're doing. But it's empty for the first year. I'm on the road, and I call Charlie one day, and he says, some people are looking at that house. Oh, yeah, they, they're both divorced. They've recently got together as a couple. In between them, they have five teenagers. 
And I say to him, you know that fence I was thinking about putting up between <laughs> our driveways? I think now would be a really good time to do it. And I do, I put up a fence. So when these very nice people move in, there's a new fence there. It wasn't there when they looked at the house, they're renters, and now there's a fence there. I wonder who put it up. Must be the nice woman across the fence going, hi, I'm your neighbor. <laughs> and, uh, and so getting to know them became very difficult. And in January 2017, when they'd been there probably uh, six to eight months or maybe a year, and all of a sudden I'm really wishing I knew them. This song started in a different place. Eventually, I learned to start this song as the first line that it is, but it took me about two months of trying it on people and saying, you know, how do I, how do I um, write this song? And I was sitting in a workshop of a woman named Sally Barris, who's an amazing songwriter, a great teacher, and she kept saying the same three things over and over again. So this is Sally's wisdom, not mine. Where am I? What do I want? How do I get there? Where am I? What do I want? How do I get there? And I'm in the back trying to edit my song. And I, the song just like laid out once I realized, where am I, what do I want, how do I get there? When the neighbors first moved in, I'm the one who built the fence. And I'm the kind who can hold out her hand if I know my line of defense. We are living in interesting times And the sky falls every day And I used to think my fence Could make the world go away But this morning all I know Is I want to fall This morning I don't need my fence I need my neighbor on the other side I've seen my neighbor with her children in the morning Driving them to school And I've seen her play a game in the driveway She knows how to set bend a rule and I don't know that much about her but I dropped in and we talked at her store and each time I come away wanting to know a little bit more and this morning I do. They change over the years. Okay. Um, for a while, uh, I was always doing morning pages. I read The Artist's Way. I love The Artist's Way. I thought it was great. Um, Julia Cameron. Uh, 
and uh, that was in uh, probably in my late 20s I started reading that and I, and I wrote the pages every day before I started writing and then uh, there was sort of a, a, a sequence of events where I thought you know what I'm using up all my creative energy writing these three pages that aren't songwriting I'm gonna start right out or songwriting so for a number of years I just started doing that and now I've sort of gone back and forth but I always if I'm home I think that my first job in the morning is to sit down and with my guitar um, you know my job as a songwriter is to come up with more songs so that when I come to your sh to your town and play songs they're not the same songs I played 20 years ago uh, so I'm trying always to create something um, it used to be I'd make my sit with myself sit there like until three in the afternoon. That was a long time ago. Now, if nothing has happened after an hour and a half, I go do something else. Tom Paxton once said this great thing about, you know, some days you might as well have gone fishing because you're just sitting there. Um, but some days a lot happens. So yeah, I, and, and I'm, I'm very much a believer in the fact that if you create the space, your, your cre creativity will start to trust you and one day it will send you that thing that shows up in 10 minutes. You know, that will occasionally happen. So let me just follow up on that. Surely each experience in the creative process of writing a song is unique, um, but for the sake of our audience, and especially our students or others who might aspire to be songwriters, <laughs> could you take one of your recent songs and walk us through the process? I can, yeah. I got one that's kind of new, it's still learning. So in February, um, I'd had a hard winter. Uh, my dad died. I was just feeling kind of down. I wasn't going through menopause. My hormones are nuts. So um, I, I had been working on this song for a long time that wasn't working. And so one morning I just thought, well, I'll just write. And I started writing with just a meter and an idea. And I was just writing. On, I wasn't with my guitar. And I just wrote this thing that said, put away all your anger. Put away all your sad. Put away all the winter. It's just a dream you had. And I had this line. I thought, OK, that's got rhythm because it's got to, your, your, your thing's got to have a rhythm and um and I've been listening to John Prine uh interview and John Prine is not worried about a melody he's not worried about it at all so um I, I probably started anywhere but I uh this is not gonna be we're not gonna actually play it I'm gonna just put it I'm gonna tear it apart so um so I just and when I started it I just put away all of your anger Put away all of your sad, sad, sad. Put away all of the winter. It's just a dream you had. So all I did was I went one, four, five chords. I just went through a circle of chords and I just used my words. And it's one of those songs that just laid out. Those are easy songs, in my opinion, to write because they just lay out. I, I have another one I'll talk about that was so much harder. But um, and then I would spend a lot of time then thinking about what the chorus was. And eventually I worked in to a place where I had this verse, and I'll, I'll tell you that the interesting thing was about how to make the chorus different from the verse. Because often in songwriting, we have this great thing, this little piece of material that's four lines with the melody. And the question is, how do we make the chorus different? And the one thing I got out of the Berkeley College of Music website was, um, maybe it was Pat Patterson, somebody, they give these little free little videos for 30 seconds, so you'll sign up. And I watched the 30, and the videos, the 30 seconds was, if you can sing the words of your chorus to the melody of your verse, or vice versa, they're too similar. They don't work. It's too and I've always thought that was a brilliant piece of information. So I have this verse that goes, let's see. Put away all of your anger. Put away all of your sad. Put away all of the winter. It's just a bad dream you had. And then I had, I, I needed something else, and I've had for years this line, I will love you to the moon. I got it in a dream. Never know what to do with it. And I'm always trying to stick it in a song. So I tried to stick it in this one, and it worked. And take out that little seed, the hope that we all need. I will love you to the moon. And I just had that for a while, and I was doing my taxes. So I just thought, what would the next line be? Put away all your receipts, because I don't really put anything. What you owe and what you'll keep. So I'm staying saying, Verses, same melody. Your plan to survive if the drop is sudden and steep. And everything in this line, song, for my rule, is it has to actually talk to me. And my dad had died. And I'm like, how am I going to survive with what I inherited? You know, will I die? So that's what that, your plan, I don't know why that's doing that. Sorry, Bill. Uh, Put away all your receipts, what you owe and what you'll keep. Your plan to survive if the drop is sudden and steep. Let the afternoon come. 
maybe not get anything done because by now I have a melody, I have, I have a rhyme scheme. You know, these first two lines rhyme and the last two lines rhyme and then there's a line at the end that doesn't have to rhyme to anything. I will love you to the moon. And the chorus shows up as a piece. It's a total gift, but it starts out to the moon. Uh, uh, to the moon on the mornings when you're feeling old. All the warnings you were ever told seem to be coming true. When you can't remember how or why Love might hang in your sky And I had it that way for a while And the problem is they're too similar So I one day thought th I, I'd also gone to another fabulous songwriting workshop By a woman named Susan Catania And she had this one piece of info I get like one piece of information from all speech, And she said, if you're going to have a note in your chorus Don't let it show up in your verse <coughs> Let it just be show. It's got to be special If you use it a lot in your, in your verse It's not going to be special when you show up in your chorus. So, so I thought, well, okay, well, let's find a note I haven't used. To the moon. So, it, so I thought, okay, I've got to change it. To the moon on the mornings when you're feeling old. All the warnings you were ever told seem to be coming true. To the moon when you can't remember how or why love might hang in your sky. And so what I have now is I have a song that has a verse and a chorus, and I actually am not entirely sure that it's done yet, because they tell you that you need to have, you know, off you need to have a bridge, doesn't need to have a bridge. I'm probably going to live with this song for a while, because I don't have to record it. it. It might need something else, but I'm pleased with how it just showed up. I've had other songs, so, you know, take 10 years, because they just don't show up. I'm not sure if that answers what you were asking for, but... No, exactly what that I was okay. yeah. Yeah, is that, I mean, that, I think that gives us a picture. Let me ask you, you know, kind of a, a follow-on from there. So that that's sort of that, you're still in that mode of the really creative yep. process, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Talk about editing. Oh, my God. I edit things to death. I am a bad, I, I'm bad news with editing. That's a problem for me is I over-edit, but it's not... It's not that you shouldn't edit. Um, I, I, I have students who write a song and they come into my workshops in these adult camps and they're like, I wrote a song, it's ready, it's done. I mean, this is an hour after he started it. And he's like, it's done. And I kind of want to say, you know, you might want to check in with it tomorrow. See if tomorrow you might want to change it. For me, editing is over time. We are all in love with our song when we first write it. So am I. I think it's perfect. I want you to hear it exactly as it is and I can't think of anything that needs to change. But the next day, I go, oh, I didn't notice that. There's that little, there's that little weird spot right there. Or I get bored. Uh, you know, if you come to, if you, I, I find if you, you're getting through a song and there's a spot where I get bored of singing it, definitely needs work. If I'm getting bored, my, my audience is definitely gonna get bored. Um, or there's a place where I mumble. I, I've talked to other people about this. If there's a spot in your song where you mumble, you probably don't feel really good about those lyrics. You probably need to change them because you're mumbling them because you don't think they're that good. Um, for me, editing is also done by trying them out on people. I perform them. There's a way that an audience will look like they're watching you, and then there's the time when they go, you know, and they're clearly checking out. And if I have a new song, then they do that. I think, that song isn't that good. I think of a song as a three-minute piece of, in, of energy, and it's got to be energized, very energized, to keep your attention. I mean, I play to people who've never heard my songs all the time. I'm not usually going back to people who are like, oh, we love that one, we heard it on the radio. You know, that's not my life. My life is, you gotta love it the first time. So it's gotta be really energized and it's gotta be user-friendly. You gotta. So can you give us, can you think of an example? And I know this is a little bit, little bit uh, inside baseball, a little bit revealing, but can you give us an example of an edit that you did where you say, you know, I thought, that, you know, this is what I had and it was okay, but when I was, when I, when I was editing, I found this. That it got better. Yeah. The edit got better. Yeah. Can you um, play us something, show us an example of that. Yeah, um, where the edit made it better, because I got a lot where the edit made it worse. <laughs> uh, right, now well, I got, right now I get edits that make it, um, make it uh, worse. Let me, let me just think about that for a second. Um, you know, I don't remember the beginning of one that would work. Oh, yeah. This morning, we rearranged the verses. And it made a huge difference. And this chorus, this is a new song. This chorus, Charlie, uh, I had, so here's how, this, here's how this song used to start. And here's how the chorus used to go with it. And Charlie's going to wait it out for a minute. 
the Irish they have curtains. Oops. The Irish they have curtains, some are lace, some are not. Through that Irish window, my father's father fought. His way up through the signs the Irish need not apply. He said, the family's all you can trust on your side, on your side. Your side. And the, the verse, it, it's a lot of verses with that. Your side. It wasn't ever quite taking off energetically. And this is now musically, it's not uh, lyrically. Um, and the song had started with a line, sorry, I shouldn't shake my head, with a line that was, I have my mother's silver and I run my father's store. That's what I'd written it based on because uh, I had my mother's silver and I was running my father's money because he's in a nursing home. And, 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 and I wanted to talk about that in the terms of our current world because I have a family that's very divided anyway. So, uh, but I thought I had to start at the beginning. My grandfather, see, my father's father, that's supposed to be the beginning. And then the beginning of my mother. And it turned out today, we thought, you know what, let's start in the media. There's that, here we are in a university, I will mispronounce it, in media res, res. You start in the middle of the story. And, and so what I ended up doing is realizing I have to start in the middle of this story. And often we need to start in the middle of the story. I have a lot of students where they write the song, and actually the first verse just got them into it, and the second verse is actually their first verse, but they don't know that because they think you need all this information. And we are often brought into a song much more if we start right in the middle. So that's the lyrical thing, but, uh, and we'll do the whole song, but Charlie, so this chorus, your side, and I played it for a couple months this way, and which side, and as one person, it's not bad, but the time you've heard that chorus five times, you're a little tired of it, and it doesn't make you want to sing along. It just doesn't quite have it, and I didn't know why. And this is when one of the this is when the notes are are magic energy. You don't quite know why a note. I mean, anybody can tell you about the theory, but when they actually talk to you about coming up with a melody it, it, in books, they say it's you're lucky you had inspiration. You don't build a brilliant. You don't build one of those magic melodies. They show up. Uh, and I'm not saying this is magic, but Charlie's improved this. So, so what happened is we're playing this chorus, and now Charlie, I'm going to have you. Charlie starts coming up with a way to sing it, and so he's singing at harmony, and I'm changing my harmony. So now let's sing the, cho the chorus the way it is now. With the, with the bass, yeah, right? you can play it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which side? He changed his note, so I changed my note. And this, to me, I mean, you may all disagree, because we just did this like two weeks ago, but we think this is a better chorus. Which side? Which side? Yeah, well, we're gonna do it, but hopefully it's gonna make you want to sing along. So now we're gonna do the whole song for you. Okay, ready? Okay. So Charlie, you're gonna play your little riff. Because now we have a hook. So we're gonna do it again. So we have a hook. Dividing up the world just comes natural to me. <clears throat> and the Irish, they have curtains. Some are lace and some are not. And through that Irish window, my father's father fought. His way up through the signs, the Irish need not apply. He said, the family's all you can trust. On your side, which side? Which side? And on my mother's side, they would recite the family tree. God freed his wing with all of his pilgrim progeny. And there's a family homestead and a historic sign. And they'd like you to know they have. Sing along. Which side? And oh, now the family, what will we do? Cause 
There are cousins who are red And there are cousins who are blue And we gather at the wedding And we gather at the wake And we leave it at the door For the family's sake Which side? Which side? We pull on the rope We pull as hard as So I yeah, and, and I was starting to cough, and I thought, oh my God, I got these lavalier ears, I can't do that. So, but, but that is the closest I can think today. A lot of my other edits, I forget what's beyond it, you know, so this is a recent one, so I remember it. Yeah. You, you would be completely right um, in your assessment of that, because by starting in that middle, it really draws you in. You're painting a picture, with one of, and it makes you want to know more about what's going, you know, where did that come from? What is it all about? It, you, yeah, it, Thank you. It really you. works. Thank you. See, this is the first example of my edit work, so thank you. <laughs> That's how edits work. You try it out, and somebody goes, oh, I understand it. Thank you very much. There's a question that I often like to ask or wonder about, even when I listen to, uh, you know, listen to songwriters. Um, and I think it's one that I like in this context because <clears throat> I think that um, it, it, it might reveal something to, uh, to students. And that is, how often do you write, how often have you written a song that, you know, you really didn't necessarily write it for an audience, and maybe this was really something where you're working through something inside Oh my yourself. God, oh yeah, I got those. And, 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 that, and, that, and then ultimately, you know, you find that you, you end up playing it for people and, you know, and, and it works. And, I, and really, and, there, and, and I say all that because in your case, you have written some of the most incredibly revealing songs that I've ever heard anybody do. And so, but talk about that a little bit. Uh, okay. So for me, songwriting, I can't write a song about something. I just think that's a good idea to write a song about. That doesn't work for me. It has to come from my emotional... It, it just has to. I, I'm that kind of writer. People in Nashville are making a lot of money because they have that other ability and I don't have it. So I'm definitely coming from what's going on with me. And some of my songs, it could be argued, are too personal. But uh, when Bill, when you ask that question, I go immediately to this one song that I wrote for myself to figure it out. Um, and it is personal, but I have kind of learned that if I, get, within reason, get personal enough here, somebody in the audience is gonna hear a song that connects to them. And it doesn't mean I've, I've, I've like saved them or anything, but it might you know, talk to them in a way and give them a way of talking about something. So, uh, I had a 20 year relationship and when it ended, it was very difficult for me. And I did not write any songs because I did not want to go near that emotional spot. I'm like, I'm not writing any songs. I played guitar for months. I just like, I'm just playing a guitar. And uh, when I met, finally met Charlie, um, I was, feeling less distraught enough. And he said, you know, you gotta write a song. And uh, this song came out in one night. That, that hardly ever happens to me. And I hadn't, but it was totally about me needing to say this to you. I mean, you never wanna break up with a songwriter because all they do is they write songs about you. It's really, it's, he, we're both songwriters. I mean, it was sort of like, you know, I'm gonna aim my song at you. And I was bad about it. I mean, I really was bad. But for me, uh, the song has to resonate with me in my belly, you know, for it to work. And uh, it, it, for, if for whatever reason, the way I am built, uh, you, you have to get pretty personal to get in there, I guess. I come from a very, you know, well, one half, as you know, very waspy sort of ethereal family, or cerebral family where, you know, you don't, you don't have emotion in the room. It's, it's not the light. <laughs> So 
So what happened, how this works is that I'm finally not thinking that I'm going to be alone for life and it's awful and how I will survive because I've met this wonderful man and uh, have written nothing all summer. And I think you gave me the assignment to write about that or something. Somehow Charlie gave me the assignment that night. He's in Boston, I'm in Utah, we're far away, and he said, I want you to write a song. And the other thing I want to say is that this melody is not an original event. The songs that are very emotional for me, the, the melody, I'm not really worried about making it an original event. This is, uh, this is from listening to Randy Newman play piano on albums for years. I love his chord progressions. And the closest you can, for me, get to it is to be at an open D. This is totally Randy Newman. I mean, I didn't make that up. say I don't play this very much anymore too much because I worried that the audience would come up to me afterwards and go are you okay and when I have a song where the audience comes after and goes are you okay I know that it's so personal that I can't always do it so. ever since you left I have wondered what would be the first song how to write, no, how to wrap a string of words around all the ways we went wrong. All the phrases I started, all the pages I erased. I've thrown out as many lines as I watched over time find their way onto your face. Truth be told, most of us have, it's kind of like so asking somebody what their favorite child, who, who right. their favorite child is, but most of us have a favorite child. Most of us have a favorite song. For mine, it's a current favorite song. Is that okay? Sure. I totally have one right now. Would you play it? Oh, yeah. I love this song. This song took me forever to write. And luckily, it's in a close tuning. So, uh, and this is a song about editing and an accident, a great accident. The, the chorus on this song is a musical engine. And if you can have a musical engine, your song will just like 
charge forward. And it's because I'm moving around the circle of fists, which I know sounds way brainy, and I can't tell you that I built it that way, but I realized when I was doing it, this is a really happy accident, which means you're moving from these really powerful cords that have such like strong relationships to each other that they have a lot of energy because it's hard to get there. That's one way to describe it. There's much better ways. And I really wanted to talk about the thing, <clears throat> but I didn't want to get too, um, you know, school marmy about it. And the thing was that I had read that our lettuce has been over-engineered to be sweeter, and so it's not as good for us. And if it was more bitter, it would be better for us. And it was about six years ago when arugula started being everywhere, and because uh, arugula is bitter. And in the, argument, in, in the article that I read in like 2012, 2013, it says that uh, phytonutrients are this bitter thing that's really good for us. They're, they're in bitter greens. And I spend five years writing this song because it takes that long to figure out how to write a song without using the word phytonutrient, which <laughs> not really singable. I mean, maybe in a Broadway tune or something. But I had a student in one of my songwriting classes who was an old English professor at Stanford. I mean, she was brilliant. She was so much smarter than me. And she said this thing that I'll just pass on. I'm probably uh, destroying this piece of information, but she said the Anglo-Saxon language likes one-syllable words. So that's why we often write with one-syllable words. Uh, I can't remember why I'm telling you this, but phytonutrient is not a one-syllable word. <laughs> And the reason this song is my favorite right now is the chorus has so much energy. When I get there, I can just feel this lift of energy for me, so. I'm in the wrong code. It's not an open G, it's in dadgad, for those of you at home following along with the tunings. Okay, so here we go. Consider the lettuce, it's not as healthy as they said. Like certain anxious dogs, it's a little overbred. They made it as sweet as they can, cause that's what sells at a produce stand. Turns out something bitter is better for you. Oh, the rabbits and the woodchucks have known this all along. They're not getting into your garbage. They are out there in your lawn When the world feels like a deadly place Eat something we can't erase You want to survive, eat the dandelion If you want to make it up the hill Eat something we cannot kill They want to give you one more pill Get down in the dirt, maybe you will Find a trait you can admire A living thing that won't expire Times are dire gonna make us stupid make us fat and i'll tell you where your health is at go out and eat the yard if you wanna make it up the hill eat something we cannot kill they wanna give you one more pill get down in the dirt maybe you will find a trait you can admire a living thing that won't expire times are dire eat the dandelion A living thing that won't expire Times are dire Eat the dandelion Everybody Times are dire Eat the dandelion Thank you Okay Who has
has that last burning question. You have a minute. This is your last chance. Do we have another final song? I guess that's a question. Yeah. <laughs> Any particular thing you want it to be about? Just in case I have one that I can pull out. <laughs> you want current events or female problems? Okay. <laughs> You probably don't want the yeast infection. Charlie doesn't like that one either. <laughs> is, this, is this one I'm going to know? <laughs> yeah, you'll know it. I'm still thinking, but you're going to know it. I think what we'll do is, uh, this is what I used to call the uh, theme song to the Midlife Crisis Tour. So somewhere along the way, I hired a consultant once to hire, watch me perform, thinking that, you know, this would, she would give me some insights, <clears throat> and then she did. She called me up the next morning. She says, well, I like your songs, and I like what you're wearing, but it looks like you just gave up from the neck up. <laughs> <laughs> and then I paid her, so she was very inspiring. Uh, but she really did inspire me, and I, I, uh, this, this, song, this song came out pretty fast because I think I really meant it. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember what, if, what the original melody was to it, because often I write songs to like one, you know, if you're on a bike ride or something, but anyway. So this is the theme song to the Midlife Crisis Tour, which, you know, was a bit of a while ago, but let's say it's still happening. Uh, this is the Botox Tango. <laughs> Gravity's heavier than I expected And it's pulling things out of place My skin is getting longer than my face And it's pooling in the creases Although my vigilance never ceases With the emollients and the greases I am a puzzle losing its pieces and the cracks are slowly growing between my tectonic plates. Continental drift for man or woman never waits. And there's no point in self-deceiving. Like Australia, part of me is leaving. Now I'm on a loud lyre, so I can't scream, but this where I would usually scream into the mic. I always wanted more facial definition and a somewhat stronger chin. Now I'd be happy with just a remission of this loss of collagen. You can put your fears to rest. I won't be getting any in the chest. It wouldn't solve any problem. Give me two more things to fall So I am thinking of getting injected I'm getting older sooner than I expected <laughs> I want to thank our audience, especially our students, for being here and I, before we uh, before we thank uh, Cozy, I uh, would like you to play us one more song. And I'm going to break my own rule and ask you if you would uh, play one of, that I'm going to request. Okay. Would you, would you play Quietly, Liz? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, totally. So this song, I'm glad you asked for that. This song was uh, one, one of my early songs of, of uh, not trying to be too logical about how the chorus worked. And it was also the first song where I realized that my right hand of my guitar uh, could create some energy if I just figured out how to make it more of a percussive instrument.
Clarín.